My name is Anna O'Halloran. I'm the president of the Public Schools. I'm welcoming you all and thank you so much for being here to enjoy these fabulous people on our panel. The tour is moving over to the Kaplan for a minute. Uh,
And um, I'm going to call on um, Sheila Dexter from um, the Executive Director of JALSA, the Jewish Alliance for Law and Social Action, who will kick off the program. Thank you, Sheila. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. Um, Citizens for Public Schools was started by American Jewish Congress in 1982. Uh, specifically, it was a ballot committee in those years. And those were uh, years in which we were concerned uh, about separation of church and state, particularly, and concerned that we might lose, because of the ballot issue, the, um, the protection that Massachusetts gives uh, to make sure that the public money goes uh, uh, primarily to public schools, so and for public school education. Um, Sumner Kaplan was a member of JALSA in those years, but he was on the bench. But just as soon as he retired from the bench, he came back to us, and Citizens for Public Schools was one of his, his main uh, interests and pursuits, first as part of the American Jewish Congress, and then as part of JALSA, Jewish Alliance for Law and Social Action, which is what we moved to um, some uh, almost 11 years ago. So uh, I have a feeling that many of you in this room know Sumner. But it does seem particularly appropriate as we start this first memorial lecture for Sumner that we emphasize how much he cared about public education. And for him, it was part and parcel of what he cared about in terms of democracy. He was a fervent, fervent advocate and spokesperson for democracy, caring very much about civil liberties. And to him, public education was the way in which democracy was going to thrive. So together with his pursuit of justice and his pursuit of democracy, and public education, um, we had a very, very special person in our midst for a wonderful number of years. So it's a pleasure to have this forum tonight. I know he cared very much about the subject matter, so I, I welcome you all and look forward to our deliberations tonight.
like Marty, but probably even more so than Marty. Um, I obviously could speak for 30 um, years about um, my father, Sumner Chaplin, and uh, who was clearly my mentor and inspiration. Um, and uh, I just want to say that um, one of my old friends who was here tonight, who I was surprised to see come, said to me, well, Ruth, if it was just coming to see you, maybe I would
a democracy in which uh, virtually everyone, with some very important exceptions, virtually everyone uh, is a member of the so-called society that they are in. And uh, we're having a hard time trying to imagine even what that would be. If I look around the world and spend, well, where do we kids learn about democracy? You know, if they, they want to be a shoemaker, they go and watch the shoemaker make shoes, I believe that. Um, and if they want to be a basketball player, they watch a lot of basketball. Now, if you uh, want to be good at democracy, what would you, uh, where would you go to watch it at work? Uh, our families are not set up for that task. Um, although, I think there are ways uh, in which the culture of the family <coughs> influences good citizenship or uh, works against it. But what is the public institution, a public obligation, to, because it wants everybody to be a good citizen, what institution have we set aside for that purpose? And I would say that if you randomly selected 100 schools in America, and went into them and tried to fix you, find something in there that suggested democracy, you would find it in very few of them. And least of all, in um, the 47% uh, <laughs> or the 99%, <coughs> I don't know where Brookline fits in. But where is it, Dr. Top? <laughs> It's a way about time we talked about it. And unfortunately, we're talking about it <coughs> just the moment in which the institution itself is being, in many ways, grabbed, taken away from us. There is, and I'll state this uh, only in 10 minutes as a fact, there is a very large and powerful and wealthy constituency of well, wealthy and powerful people in this country who join together, they meet the, one of the organizations they meet is a group called ALEC, A-L-E-C, uh, in which they literally plan, not uh, with some coded language, uh, on how to turn American public schools into private free market schools. Because they genuinely, their definition of democracy uh, is the free marketplace. Uh, it's a limited picture of what we mean by democracy, but it's that you can choose to buy this brand of toothpaste or that, that's a democratic decision, or this school or that, that's a democratic decision. And uh, in a free marketplace with lots of competition, the best schools rise and some people are too stupid to realize what the best schools are, so uh, it's their own fault, so because if they would take a little more time, they would I, I haven't figured out the whole way of playing it out, but this is not an accident of well-meaning people. Uh, it's a plan of people who have, whose definition of well-meaning is different than my own, so let's put it kindly. Uh, you know, I always say, you know, uh, the wonderful thing about democracy is that you could be wrong and they could be right about something. So I do keep trying to figure out if there's going to be something in this, uh, terrible drive to eliminate public education that we can salvage from it um, that will be, leave us stronger in the long run. And will there be a long run for democracy? I don't think we should ever take that for granted. And I did when I was a child because I was told that it started in the Middle East. Let me see if I can remember. And then uh, civilization I'm talking about. And then it went to Egypt, and then it went to Greece, and then it went to Italy, Rome, and then it went to England, and then it came to the United States. And uh, it, it, we kept, kept getting more and more democratic. And uh, you don't have to do anything about it, just the arc of history leads there. And uh, I, I think the last 50 years have suggested that may not be uh, something we can count on. And I think there are so many institutional changes in the last 15, 20 years uh, from that far in the direction that uh, this Alex wants to go in. We have the privatization of the army. You know, there are 100,000 men in Afghanistan and women. 
experience as a citizen of democracy, women decide to their country now. So men and women in Afghanistan who are private belong to, are contracted out on a private basis, and someone makes a profit off it. Uh, we really have 180,000 troops in Afghanistan, but only 80,000 of them belong to the United States Army. We pay the others privately. And uh, prisons, uh, it's a growing industry, prisons in general, but private prisons is the fastest growing part of the prison industry. And that goes for hospitals and you, you name it. Uh, it no longer even seems to startle people that our baseball stadiums, I'm an old baseball fan, you can see, our baseball stadiums are no longer named after the, either the town or the team. Now, I think that's really going to the very low. <laughs> uh, it, it just shocks me, except for the Yankees. <coughs> Uh, they kept, they kept it called Yankee Stadium. Fenway Park. Fenway Park. Okay, Boston and New York for us, because uh, it, 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 when I was growing up, if people, my mother would, uh, you know, if I wore something that had a label on it, uh, advertising some company, she was furious. You know, if they're making money off that, you don't make yourself into a money-making machine. And uh, that, that, even that idea seems strange to us now. And our schools are filled with private institutional interests. And it would be hard to explain even to many young children why there's something wrong with that. Uh, where, you know, when we say separation of this and that, Inequality of wealth, never. And when I sometimes say this to some people, they say, "Well, are you just jealous of them that they have all that money?" And I think I'm just deeply offended. And they they look as though that idea that you should be offended if somebody spends on their daughter's birthday what your family may earn over five years. And they well, why shouldn't they if they can get it? And uh, I I think our schools. Um, are, were intended, in our minds at least, to be the place where you understood the complexity of democracy, the messiness of democracy, the way the, it's balanced, the consequences, the continuously exploring if we do this, what are the unintended consequences, and learn about compromise not as a viewpoint of uh, uh, corrupting people, but that is compromise as the heart of democratic culture. And it's no wonder we don't think of it that way today. We think of it as a, a corrupting force. But a healthy democratic institution is always making compromise. It's always changing its mind, thinking about the other possibilities. And schools are, could be, and I think to some degree once were at the heart of communities. But in the absence of communities, it's hard to have a heart. So, uh, I think Massachusetts is an interesting place to talk about this because Massachusetts is sort of famous for its town meetings, for its local local localism. And uh, I was in some ways stunned at how easily Massachusetts gave up some of that uh, in the last 15, 20 years around COVID. I, I, I didn't expect it. I thought they'd have a hard time convincing local communities in Massachusetts to give up their local authority on the raising of their children. And I was wrong. And we are in a moment now, I think, where some of the tide is turning. But uh, we have, uh, Faircast is our, uh, one of the sponsors, right? Anyway, Faircast, I want to urge you to give to it because Faircast uh, hires two people whose job it is to combat the billions of dollars being put into the protest and movement by the American corporations. And, um, you know, it, that little David has done a good job, but we need all of us uh, to have our own Goliath also. We've got the 
Martin is so David, uh, but some of the resources that Goliath didn't know how to use. So I, I'm hoping we'll have an interesting discussion tonight on what we can do to turn this <laughs> Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, I just want to say, uh, as, as a member of the current um, Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, it's very interesting to think about um, the terms and words that do not come up in conversation on, in, in um, educational policy. And I have to say that democracy is not something that gets talked about. And I think it's very telling to, to note um, the absence of the things that, that are on the table, and that is one of them, as is civic engagement and social so um, having said that, I'd like to introduce, I'm very pleased to introduce um, Jim McDermott, um, who I did serve with on the Board of Education. Um, Jim was a member of the Board um, of Elementary and Secondary Education in 2010-11, appointed by Governor Patrick. He's a former Massachusetts Teacher of the Year. His work focuses on schools in the Hyatt Maine South Secondary School Collaborative, the University Park Campus School in Worcester where he taught for six years, creating the Secondary English Program, and South High Community School, where he taught and coached for 25 years. Uh, Professor McDermott works with uh, masters and MAT students, encouraging student teachers to develop classrooms that engage all urban students in rigorous content, content in a warm and inviting environment. Reading, writing, and thinking are at the center of Professor McDermott's pedagogy, and I can say from experience that Jim is not shy about uh, speaking truth to power and uh, speaking out in um, formal and informal settings, so it's really a pleasure for me to have him by my side tonight. Thank you, citizens of the public schools. Thank you, Brookline. Thank you, Judge Sumner, you Kaplan, for all you continue to do as we still hold dear your legacy. I never met you, Judge, but I'm learning about you now. You must have been an uncommon gentleman, uncommonly committed, uncommonly gifted, uncommonly competent, uncommonly just, uncommonly giving, uncommonly courageous, in short, a most uncommon citizen type that strengthens our democracy. The sort of type I want teaching my kids in the urban schools. Imagine someone with your love and wisdom, Judge, teaching 10th graders at some of the urban schools that I've been in. Right away, you'd sense the inertia. Right away, you'd recognize that the central problem of all education is making learning come alive. Right away, you'd see too many kids dying on the vine, bored out of their minds in classrooms. Right away, you'd understand the need for personalization and purpose in teaching and learning. Right away, you'd work to transform those classrooms into dynamic learning laboratories that recognize each child as a thinking and feeling human being, able to grapple with rigorous material in an honest and meaningful I've been lucky, Judge. I've met many uncommonly awesome teachers, but not enough. And I fear many may be turning away. Eileen Bobbery, she taught first grade in the school of budding the largest housing project in Central Mass. When I visit her, she'd be in the back of the room. And she'd say, Jimmy, I'm busy. If you need to know anything, ask a child. This was first grade. <laughs> a little girl invariably would grab me by the finger and move me back to the back of the room. The back of the room were, this particular day, were a bunch of jars. In the jars were bugs. It was a science lesson on insects. So I went to touch one of them. The little girl said, oh no, you can't touch them yet. Look at the, uh, look at the data where, where um, they can't eat until a little later on. And if you touch them, it changes everything. I said, oh my goodness. You look outside the door, um, there's a little patch of green out there. And there's a bunch of parents out there with their children, and they're scurrying around for more bugs, of course, night crawlers. In the middle of the room is a, a, a 
there were a bunch of kids, and they're putting the polishing touches on a gigantic big book. It's bigger than they are. It's illustrated, and they're writing things in. In the corner is a student teacher. She's reading a book. Bubbles, of course. Eileen, she's in the back. She's got two uh, student writers. Um, they're rewriting their first draft. They call it a very, very messy stuff because, see, Eileen knows that at the beginning of a writing process, thinking, thinking is a messy process, so, so she encourages her kids to be messy, and they like being messy. In fact, she gives them big crayons so they can't be neat in the beginning, but after that, now she knows that, hmm, we have to make our thinking clearer so other people can understand what's going on, so now they're rewriting, maybe for the second or third time. Every once in a while, Eileen gets up, though, see, and leaves the two writers at their task. And like a, an, uh, like a maestro in, a, in an orchestra, she's a maestro, excuse me, in an orchestra, she's going around with little stickies on around. And of course, the little stickies represent each and every student in the classroom. And she, of course, she's informally assessing them as she goes around the room. Another little girl grabs me by the, by the little finger. And she asks me if I like plants. I say, don't you like bugs? So I like bugs, but I love plants. Inside of the room are a bunch of plants, 13 through 16 plants. She gives me the name in Latin. This is first grade. This is October. This is next to the largest um, project in central Massachusetts. This is uh, where is that? If I were to ask Eileen hmm, if she teaches reading and writing and science, she would say emphatically, no. I do not teach reading, I do not teach writing, I do not teach science. I teach young readers, I teach young writers, I teach young scientists. Eileen Lowry knows, she knows this. She knows that a thinking curriculum is not something new for some kids, but she knows it is new for all kids, and she wants to change that. Mrs. Lowry is an uncommon teacher, so good that parents in other areas of the city, go to all kinds of subterfuge to try to get their kids into this particular school. That's how good she is. She's been at the university, she talks about writing at the university, and she's forgotten more about the teaching of writing than many professors at the university. This is how good she is. Fast forward to last year. The commissioner asks, what school we should visit when we go to Worcester? I say, hey, I want to look good. Let's go to Eileen's school. We get there, and we're directed to a room where what seems like for hours, we sit in a room and we talk about testing. Seems like an hour. There's complete with the teacher who's relieved from his teaching duty to compile, compile data. Get this. He's relieved from his teaching duties to compile data. They call them Data Dave, and they think this is cute. Well, the children's name is also replaced on these triangles, and the triangles are in green, uh, yellow and red. Green, of course, those are the kids who are on track to pass tests. Red, they're not. And this is public. This is publicized. So, you know, Judge, you'd be appalled. Right away, you'd recognize that this is a deficit approach to teaching and learning. Inertia, like uh, urban smog, sits heavily now in this particular room. Eileen Barbary, she's in the room. But she's marginalized. She's given no part in this presentation. All these so-called experts are designing policies to up test scores, and no one is asking Eileen Barbary what she thinks. When I can't stand it any longer, I raise my hand and, and ask Eileen to explain to the commissioner how she doesn't teach writing, how she doesn't teach reading. Immediately she springs up. She's got that in her, in her step now, but day to day, fellow who prizes data over connecting to children cuts her off because he says we have to get back to that agenda. Eileen now teaches fourth grade, of course, runs the MCAT test. The data folk aren't, aren't fools. They want those high scores. Eileen, and everyone knows she's the great teacher, though not great enough to do her own thing in the classroom. Get this, she tells me on the way out that she has to sneak teach. Those are the words she uses because of all the directives and dean counting associated with the walkthroughs that are going on in the classroom. Sneak teaches what she does. She also tells me 
She's looking forward to an early retirement. I love the kids, Jimmy, she says, but it's killing me not to be free to do my job. Well, Judge, I think you might sadly agree with me that education for democracy is indeed at risk if we are pushing out uncommonly good teachers such as Eileen Bobbery. We could use a bit of your common, uncommon wisdom to inspire our citizens to fight back against policymakers who have such low expectations for our children and for teachers like Eileen Bobbery.
uh, conversations at times. Uh, we, unfortunately, more and more, there's less and less in that. Um, and so the fear that we face in the classroom, even in a place like Brookline, as we add on to the number of multiple measures of uh, good teaching that we face, is that we don't have enough time with our students. And the challenge I pose uh, here is these uh, initiatives may have tremendous promise, but we're gonna have to make sure that our classes are small enough and our teachers have time in the day to actually do it in a quality way, uh, not just in the quantity. And I am, as a student, uh, thinking back on the 19th century tradition of it, unionism, uh, we spend so much time of our lives working uh, in the home or in the workplace. And the 19th century unionists said, eight hours for work, eight hours for play, eight hours for what you will. And if we want to have citizens who have that capacity to be well-rounded contributors, like those unionists sought to be uh, in the 1800s, we need time, quality time. So that's the question, the accountability piece. Uh, let me talk about collaboration. Collaboration, and you hear it again, I just uh, spent the day with Dr. Lupini, our superintendent, Angela Allen, um, our human resources uh, director at a conference on collaboration between management and labor. And I heard trust, trust, trust. Teacher input matters. Uh, granting a voice to teachers is important. Um, but let's look at what it means when that is granted as a form of charity as opposed to a true collaboration where people are held accountable both ways uh, to one another as full human beings and full professionals. You know, the hierarchy can stay intact and uh, there can be a problem of really being fearful of the ramifications. Let me share one example for this one. Um, I went to a workshop this afternoon, in fact. It was on peer assistance and review. Now, if you'll indulge me, I will say that that might be, at its worst, uh, peer surveillance and firing. Um, I am hearing about a plan to get teachers out of the classroom into uh, committees in which they will be the ones that will observe, evaluate, and ultimately fire their peers. Now, uh, some of you know that next year in Brookline, we're going to be starting a new schedule, in one form or another, where we're gonna have collaboration time. That was the Brooklyn Educators Union's chief effort in the last contract, to give teachers time to help one another be the best they can be. Now, this peer uh, assistance and review adds another piece, which is I'm gonna observe you, but at the end of the year, I'm gonna tell you whether or not uh, you're gonna be sticking around. And I ask us uh, to think about what it's like when somebody is watching your class as an equal and a peer and a supportive part of the community and when they are uh, working on a committee that is going to take the job of uh, letting you go away from an administrator. And I worry about uh, what happens when contracts which institutionalize the voice uh, of teachers give way to a collaborative committee in which there is no more grievance because the procedure has been uh, agreed to by the teachers too. I worry about what it feels like to be a teacher when there is no safe haven in the building where you can take risks without wondering if it's going into your evaluation uh, folder. So uh, we can talk about uh, that sort of collaboration. Um, and what it means to really have a voice uh, that sticks. The last issue um, I'll mention is the question of equity. And um, we are struggling, and in inclusion in the new classroom, which you all don't need to be told, has the uh, picture of globalization that uh, in a microcosm uh, that you will find, whether you, know, you cross borders physically, to try to reach um, every child with an excellent education. And uh, I don't know of any teacher who gets to know a child that doesn't appreciate what it feels like to be searching for what that kid needs. But my concern about equity is the compartmentalization of that charge uh, in a building or even in a district um, at a time where we are, you've already heard about it, privatizing what it means to be in a family 
in a neighborhood, even in a town, where we forget that there are people driving what they can uh, do to get into Brookline schools. You all know, perhaps, that this is the fastest growing district. And so the pressure uh, comes, and I heard at the schools meeting the other night, that when Hancock Village wants to put in 270 low income or moderate income units, uh, everybody in the district starts to you know, shake at the problem, right, of uh, whether or not there are enough uh, seats in buildings, but, but there's also going to be enough classrooms and enough teachers. But it really uh, raises a question you will have heard uh, about what we have uh, been hearing called uh, educational apartheid. We can't afford anymore to let certain schools be the models, and uh, whether that's a charter school or a Brookline district. While uh, teachers, I live in Jamaica Plain, and I watch the families, my neighbors, uh, struggling. Should we move to Brookline? Can we stay in the Boston schools? Am I gonna get into just a handful of uh, schools where the creativity is being preserved? Um, what we start to do here is push competition into the level, every single dimension of schooling. Right? I asked uh, today, who gets to be on the committee of the teachers who do the uh, observation of other teachers? Who's getting into the uh, innovative programs? Who's going to get into the buildings where the uh, uh, teaching is well-rounded? And uh, I suppose if you're a parent in Brookline or a property owner, you know what happens when the rush to get into a limited number of seats starts driving up the cost of real estate. Until every school in greater Boston can have the same promise, you are gonna continue to find kids scrambling for those SAT and AP scores, scrambling to get into those seats in uh, schools like I had. And so I, I challenge us here to think of democracy beyond, of course, beyond the town line, because otherwise uh, the pressures become immense. Uh, and I, I hope that we will uh, support Hancock Village as a uh, enlarged, diverse housing community and find the ways to work together to make sure that our kids are getting the diversity and the teachers maintain the diversity we need be very careful about hierarchy. So uh, I hope, um, I will leave it at that, I talk about any of the, last thing I'll mention is that unions are a model of the democratic due process. When I left the meeting this afternoon, I see Ashley Adams from that Teacher Association with me, where we were adjudicating between teacher and supervisor. These are both members of our union, all right? They're having a hard time. There are struggles. We can sit there and find these relationships and look for a way that doesn't have to put people's livelihood at risk. And I remind us, teachers are members of the neighborhood, the community. They have children themselves. They have families. They are part of an effort of the middle class to make it. And we need to be struggling to create communities between our students, our teachers, and our families uh, and across those borders. And uh, I'll leave it at that in the hope that we'll hear from you about what we can do. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I think that there's gonna be a lot um, to talk about um, in the last portion of the evening, given the very interesting remarks that everybody has um, uh, offered this evening. Before we open it up for questions, I'd like to call on Ruth Rodriguez, um, who is going to um, come up and say a few words about um, stay with us. to do a project in the summer to work with families whose children didn't pass the MCAS. And I remember sitting in the, in the kitchen of this uh, Puerto Rican woman whose son had just failed the MCAS. And on my way here, she said to me, she doesn't want to go back to school. She said, Mom, what am I going to do? Spend two years? For what? I'm not going to sit for this whole month. And, you know, to me, that 
that was heartbreaking. And then I spent five years teaching kindergarten. And one of our professional development was um, to learn how to move for abuse so that we can report any abuse to their children. And I remember that how hard that was for me to um, look for signs where there was abuse. And I, I want to say to a governor and a board of um, education is that what I learned from that professional development is exactly what I'm seeing now. The abuse that this high stakes testing is having on our children. When are we as communities gonna launch a campaign and take our state to court for the abuse that they are causing on our families and children? And so because of all this feeling that I have in this powerful, um, I joined a group, uh, Save a School, in hope that we can begin to have a revolution in this country to end this. And so, in July of 2011, thousands of educators, parents, community advocates, and a few celebrities gathered in Washington, D.C. to protest the current COVID, COVID education reform. It was a powerful show of force in the several movement that sought to combat the attacks on teachers, high stakes testing, school closing, and charter conversion. The last day of the event was dedicated to the development of an agenda where SOS will go, where will SOS go from there? Calling ourselves Save Our School Movement, a steering committee was put in place, and this committee set out to work on an organizational structure to carry out the goals of the movement. This past August, Save Our School held its first People's Convention in Washington, D.C. Prior to the convention, the steering committee, along with local supporters, met several times to discuss the people's education platform. The meetings were held to gather a wide range of ideas as to the future of SOS. What does democratic education look like? What are the ways of establishing policy that is effective of the whole child, which benefit children, not businesses? Addresses issues affecting education quality and efficacy? and supporting teaching and learning that is of the highest quality and equitable and secular of our democracy. Personally, SOS is seeking to become a 51C3 and is holding elections for a board of directors. I'm hoping that some of you will consider, you can go on, on our website, Save Our School. We seek to collaborate with grass, grass, grassroots organizations and movements that share similar goals, such as stopping the corporate takeover of our public schools, Promoting a school agenda that, de that is developed by real educators and families that respect teachers and want to ensure that children receive equitable and quality education. And Citizens for Public School is just one of those likely partisan organizations that is fighting the same fight. Thank you. for questions, um, and um, you can either direct them to an individual or generally, and I will direct them to an individual. Yes. Uh, you want to stand up, George? I'm a graduate of SWS, a proud graduate, in fact, and uh, all, as were my two siblings. Do you want to tell everybody what the SWS Sure. Uh, school Within a School began in, uh, I believe, 69 as a democratic experiment in education within Brookline High School. And uh, it is still there. And uh, students work in a, with a town meeting to have influence over uh, these processes. Here's the challenge. The new regulations on evaluation and supervision call for input from students. Question is, um, what is the line between uh, having feedback from students and having feedback 
threaten the livelihood of the future. Um, one of the interesting things, I think, is that students in SWS took their role very seriously in hiring and firing. And I don't see any structural way in which, across the board, students are being, gi being given time and power to actually influence the running of their school. Uh, that would take quite a change uh, across the board. So um, it remains a kind of small little corner. Um, Uh, there actually are uh, a lot of interesting schools still alive in this country. Uh, most of them having their origins in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, who are holding on by a what's the word? Thread. Uh, and I think, uh, among our other tasks, is to figure out how to keep them alive so we can learn from them. Because when I if we don't, we keep relearning over again what's possible, and we have a wealth of experience in San Diego kids. And, uh, there are the kids in my old school in New York, Central Park East, are having uh, a reunion, which they have every so often, and they invite all their old teachers. And I, uh, these are kids I knew since they were five and six year olds, and a great many of them have gone into teaching, but it's uh, uh, the impact that's possible that uh, always kept me going was that, you know, no matter what happens in the rest of the world, the 200 children in our school are getting something very precious, and they're giving me something very precious. And so I just, uh, we, have a, we have to fight for uh, all the other schools that, but we also need to fight to protect the ones um, that are holding on by a shoestring. I'm so glad that you asked about that because we, we so quickly lose sight of those important work being done, that's still being done. There was a great book uh, on that, uh, Alan Gerlach, who uh, died recently, uh, wrote a book called Free the Children, and it has, uh, I think, one of the most wonderful accounts of San Diego that's been done. It's very Southern thing as well, but it's a great account. Rank on my age here and do what kids hate, but you know, School in School was a political organization when it started. It was involved in outside organizing and around education and other issues. I don't see so much of that these days. Yes. One thing, by the way, is to uh, disabuse them of, you know, the way people say crisis. I, I don't know where this expression came from. You should reach for your gun. <laughs> <laughs> They're about to rob you, or you reach for your wallet. Because uh, in the, the uh, fantasy, it's sort of like the fiscal cliff. The fiscal cliff. If, you, if you can get people to think, then we have to grab something, on the something, because the whole thing is collapsing. Uh, it it uh, helps us rush into terrible things, and it gives great power to those who are already organized to use that panel. So I think we have to give people some facts. Now, I, I, this is not meant in support of the old status quo. I mean, I got into teaching because I wanted to change things. So, um, but in fact, test scores in the United States they keep, uh, are better than Finland, which is number one right now in the world, if you remove the scores of poor kids. So you might think the problem is we ought to do something about it. to help those poor kids be better off. Because we have 23% of poorest of the American children live in poverty. 
and Finland in 2% live in poverty. And I, I think uh, we've just gone through a, a terrible corporate, uh, speaking of accountability scandal. Yeah. <laughs> incredible abuse of trust on the part of American corporations. And, and, and what's their response? It's the problem of the schools. <laughs> now, they're in crisis. We, uh, so forth. I think we have to uh, help answer that. Because they have a narrative, a story, that they've been saying in so many places. And of course, they have many more resources to get the story told over and over again. And uh, so, it's, uh, you know, I sometimes think, but um, our story is so much truer that I have to believe that the truth counts for something. The fact of the matter is, in the last 15 years of their, in their power in places like New York and I could go on and on, uh, they have not had any success. And they never thought that they have to show some success before they can spread it wide. Uh, you know, in other words, uh, these are experimenting on a vast scale with our children, and the only people who clearly have benefited are the people engaging in these experiments and making <coughs> money off it. I just read the, Heart, the, the Heartland Institute's report on the trigger law, and I, I couldn't believe it. They, 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 they write out this whole scenario about how private companies can take over schools, and then the school can now belong to a private company, and they only have to pay one dollar a year to own the school now. They've taken a public institution and put it into the private field. In the state of California, one of our more traditionally liberal states, the, 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 the speed at which they have instituted really crimes against us, uh, which we have they happen so rapidly, we don't have a chance to sit down and think about them. And the resources they have are so enormous that we think it's hopeless. So my, we have got to ourselves learn about the story. And SOS, I thank you, Ruth. Uh, who knows which of the institutions, that the, the rebellion going on out there, it is going to catch on. I don't know. You know, I, I thought Occupy, I went down there a lot. But I thought it was a really pretty foolish. But they've changed the conversation in America. And uh, I don't know what we'll accomplish. I'm also with Ruth on the board of SOS. I don't know what we'll accomplish. But if we sit back at home, uh, I can definitely tell you what will happen. They will definitely be there. So it's the only, you know, whether you have kids in the school or don't, we have to build a citizen movement. I think there's a bit of a involved as well and I think maybe we can tap into that I mean if you listen to the elections um, how could you not um, <laughs> but our president oftentimes got up and uh, said that he didn't want teachers teaching to the test how many of us heard him say that <laughs> so on the other hand of course his policies are, uh, uh, the central core of the policy is the test so I have to feel that there's there's a they, they sense that there's something wrong here. The fact that the president sends his child to a place where they don't focus on the common core or the test or race to the to the top also lets me think that there's that there's there's some confrontation within the hearts and minds of the people who are the policy makers. And I even sensed that while I was on the board. People on the board listening to people coming in like fair test and the rest. Hmm. They know they they know there's something immorally um, askew here. Um, but the the charter schools, for instance, um, it, it loud and clear we're we're going to come down on those schools that are level four. We're going to come down on them. Yet um, a few times on the board um, we. Uh, gave a charter to a school that we knew was underperforming since 1998. Um, so there's, you know, there's that, th there's some tension there. So I really think that it can be changed, but I don't think it can be changed from the top. I don't think we 
in way for it i think it's got to be community based i think people when they're sick in schools have to parents if they believe this have to say my kid in the fourth grade not going to take the m cas this year i think we have to start letting people i wonder what they would do in brookline my goodness if indeed you think that it's abusive well i you know i don't think the test itself is abusive i think the the approach we're taking the attitude and the approach there's a schizophrenia there as well that test see is called mcas comprehensive assessment system that's what it was supposed to have been i know i was there in the beginning it's now mt uh, maybe even we could start that way let's change the name of the test from mcas to mt at least to be honest about it but just the very fact that it's still set as a comprehensive assessment system makes me think that people realize this can't work my goodness now mtc not only is just which was once supposed to be a little piece of a larger assessment system an assessment by the way comes from the latin not only plants come from the latin it means to sit beside and help so the whole idea in the beginning of this 1993 reform movement was to transform the classrooms each and every classroom now we've got it mixed up now that mtc not only is the whole mcas test it also uh, evaluates teachers and it also is supposed to st uh, show student growth talk about being caught in an Orwellian culture and so, it's supposed to tell which schools of education uh, it, it's supposed to rate schools of education how many of their teachers help raise children's scores uh, <laughs> you know, just a quick thing on that I, I don't think that teachers are, from where I sit Teachers are very open to debating whether or not certain kinds of approaches are working well. Uh, we have an initiative in Brookline, some of you know, called the Benchmark Assessment System for uh, Literacy. You know, a lot of teachers think there's some worth in this. What, what they're struggling with is how much do you want, how many of these do you want me to do every day by what date on the calendar when I'm also trying to teach a well-rounded curriculum? So, you know, I appreciate this crisis mode and the intensity. There's, there's a tipping point after which you do lose the relationship that you're seeking if you are piling on, and I'm gonna plug unions. Unions see the big picture, because we know it's not just that the BAS is, in, is good or bad, it's that the BAS is combining with something else, is combining with, and we are the full people that live that school day with these kids. And uh, so we need a little bit more authority as professionals to be able to say, we appreciate your research out there, but it's not workable down here. And, uh, there's, a, there's a book I urge you all to read sometime called Seeing, I think it's Seeing Like a State by someone named James Scott. And his arguments, and I, I, I run into this all the time, and how powerful his description is that uh, there literally is a different view, a different perspective when you look at it like a state or like a corporation than uh, like a teacher or a parent or a child. And uh, so even well-meaning people look down and they say, oh, if only this would go there and this would go here and I couldn't do it here. And I do this, uh, it will work. So let's do it tomorrow.
roadblocks for the rest of their lives when they're faced with these high stakes questions. It doesn't mean at all that I agree with them, but I'm also not sure what the answer is when all I've seen in other schools that like try to move away from the test, try to encourage creativity and critical thinking, the students aren't actually able to get as far as they want to because they're consistently hitting those roadblocks. So, but I'm also really young, so I'm hoping maybe you have some more experience or ideas of like. You know, I, I, I had the opportunity to, to go to a school that um, was just sort of beginning and was in the um, was in the fourth section of, of Worcester, it was University Park Campus School, and when I went there, the students were just moving into high school, so I was given the job of setting up the high school curriculum. And the first thing I did was I went to the principal and said, she asked me what I wanted, and I said, I'd like a hawk nest table in my room. People know what a hawk nest table is? Yeah, a hawk nest table is the, the, the tables that are used at Phyllis Exeter. So, and they symbolize the, the, the powerful learning that goes on at, 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 at Phyllis Exeter. So that's what I thought we'd do, see? So, in there, so what we would do is we would have a thinking curriculum for all of those kids. So what we would do, we'd have these tables. See, the, the symbolism is you've got the table symbolizes the learning that's in the middle of the room, and it's up to the teachers and the, and the students to overturn and uncover this rigorous material. So what you have to do is you have to get kids reading and writing and thinking. And the kids in the middle, in the, uh, my kids, they didn't have any books in their homes. They didn't sit around tables and, and discuss things uh, with their folks in the evenings. So we had to recreate those wonderful times in the homes for these kids in the school. And so what we did see is we focused on creating powerful learning where powerful learning leads to understanding of rigorous material on the way to understanding ourselves as the complex people we are. So the side effect was we had the highest scores in the state, even close to Brookline, I think, <laughs> for a number of years. Well, that surprised us because we weren't focusing on getting kids ready for the test. We figured if it was a good test, and it was full of reading, writing, and thinking, then that's what we were going to do. And it did surprise us that, you know, we had that national um, reputation now that the kids do well on the test, but we never focused on the exam. So here's the thing. I'm not afraid of those exams. You focus on powerful learning, doing the right stuff in the classroom, getting these kids up to academic snuff. And you know, when you trust the kids, then when they know and they're believed in, then they go on and, be, and they're imaginative and creative and they go on. But if you focus on the test, the chances are that all of them won't result in understanding. And even at Brookline, I dare say, I, even some of you people here must remember those days in school where you've done school well, where you didn't, really didn't learn well. And so, that's the kind of come. So that's the struggle you're in. And I suggest you focus on those kids reading, writing, thinking. Treat them as the thinking and feeling human beings they are. And the side effect is that. No, I just, I just, because I disagree with you, Chris. So I, I just want to put out the question that I, I, I the, the fact is, charter schools in this country are not doing better. Some are doing better, some are doing worse, but they're, as a whole, they're simply not getting higher scores. Some are, some aren't. There are public schools that um, are doing better. Someone was giving me data about Brockton High School. Uh, it, it, in other words, that's not a, it's not a good argument. For, the reason you're, it's a good argument is if you're in a nice charter and you have no other choice, children are children, so God bless you. But uh, the reason that you're to be teaching the charter is not because charters are an answer to it. There are just as many failing charter schools if you stick only to looking at test scores. Now, the, the second that is the reason I don't like your bragging about that school <laughs> is because I know a lot of wonderful schools that don't get high test scores. And uh, the, the fable that we all need this early in life because we do it more. It's like lining up. I said, why should children line up at the age of four? 
they said, well, because they'll have to learn how to apply that by being a Swiss cheese and they'll get in a better habit. So uh, there may or may not be times in our life when we, do. I never had took a test until uh, I decided uh, to go to graduate school. That was the first time I took a standardized test in my life. I, I spent a little time learning about standardized tests at that point. And that's a wise thing to do. But to have more and more of them is not a wise thing to do. And the years that Mission Hill was formed at MCAS, in which its kids did not take standardized tests, those kids did just as well in 10th grade standardized tests as the kids who were going taking them in third grade. So it's, it's, the facts are we don't need that to assess kids, and that it does both to children harm, and that testing is a, it's simply like scientifically, by the psychometricians who argue in this country, and we have a, some very good ones here in Boston, uh, have argued that these are uh, very poor instruments for the purposes they're being used. And the old days, the test makers used to send us their manuals. They don't do it anymore. And the manuals would tell you right there in front that the measurement error on this test is about a half a year either direction, which means the odds are the child who has a 4.5 could be a 4 or a 5, a year apart. And that's within the, uh, the norm. And they would tell us that these should not be used to make any major decisions. <laughs> and I mean, they, they say there's too much error. A third of them are much farther out than half a year either direction. So it's uh, the possibility of doing harm to a child or an instrument that even those who have designed them acknowledge are not intended for the purposes that they're using. I, I think that's terrible, and I don't think charter schools have any better excuse than anybody else.
It's a good way to avoid, you know, yeah. it's a good way uh, to avoid having to pay for the well or have pitch plants. Because when you first enter the field, the first five years, you're kind of even annoyed about them taking money out of your uh, paycheck for pension. I'm never going to be that old. And, uh, but it, it, so it, I think you're right. We end up arguing about each one of these, but they all make sense from a different perspective. And uh, uh, just one other thing I wanted to say, because you used the word collaboration several times, and I realized that um, I, I think the research for about five years abolished that word. Just to talk about that people need to learn when and how to resist. We're, we're in a state of, uh, we're in a political state right now where learning how to resist, especially for teachers, is more important than learning how to collaborate. <laughs> about creating what I call powerful learning in the classrooms. And it seemed uh, from the beginning, her intention was to focus on creating powerful learning in the classroom so that, which led, would lead to an understanding, which is different from teaching to a test and following the testing, the data system. So she was, she was fighting against that. The other good thing about that union was that, um, for me anyways, and no offense here, but I, I think what they, they, they took the union over. These particular teachers were renegade outlaw teachers who overcame the bureaucracy of that particular union and were fighting for their kids. Oh, no, there have been uh, several revolutions before that. So the, they were taking over another revolution before. So part of, uh, part of what's special different about Chicago, and I, I spent a lot of time there too, is that hasn't had a history, for whatever reason, of uh, a union leadership that has been in power for a very long time. And uh, that has, uh, and therefore teachers who are not accustomed to thinking about being organized and organizing. But the funny thing is, I mean, uh, you know, there's a, there was a law passed in Illinois that they thought was put an end to, uh, to we have a model of Detroit, about how they planned their first year. The guy who planned this was dumb enough to get Kate is saying that if we insist on that you can't have a strike about 75% of the members supporting it, that'll kill off uh, any public employee strike. And they passed such a law. And it's how, much, how many of you know that 98% of 98%, or 98% of the people who could vote in Chicago voted, and of those 98% voted to go on strike. And when they did polls about what parents thought, more than 60, more than two thirds of the parents said, not just that they would back them and so forth, but said they should go on strike and we're going to join them. And that uh, coalition was unbeatable. And it's the coalition between parents and teachers that I think unions have uh, done the least good job, but I'm also really absolutely have to have a body like the union, public education. 
but that uh, we we teachers have a history of of swearing, uh, and it's often a history between siblings of women, mothers, <laughs> and women teachers. It's a long history. It would be intriguing to write about it, but as having been on both sides of that, uh, there's a, a certain tradition of blaming each other, and to overcome that is one of the important features, I think, of the kind of school reform I want, is to uh, figure out how we can build a family school coalition that uh, is full of contention and argument, but is also full of solidarity. And that, that, that is something that I think uh, would be a major change in the way we think about schools. Um, and I, I'll just plug that Sean Barrett is a Chicago teacher, and we're flying him out to sit down and really share their experience on Saturday. Uh, collaboration often means you take a few teachers and you put them on the superintendent's committee. <laughs> and, and then you really have a good conversation. But in the end, who decides what is uh, dispensable? And unfortunately, unions sometimes have to act in that unified way to make sure that they still have the seat at the table after it becomes inconvenient. And uh, what the Chicago people have done, I think, is change, change the direction that we are uh, headed. So um, I know there are more questions, and the library is open for a little longer, and people can come up if, if I can indulge the speakers to engage a little bit more. Um, I'm going to call on Anna Halloran to conclude, but before I do, uh, <laughs> And I think Anne is the perfect person to call on because um, Anne exemplifies, in a way, um, a wonderful um, evolution of a teacher, a retired teacher, who's really become an activist. And I think in terms of being a role model for uh, somebody who had been in the trenches, who herself was uh, a teacher of the year in Massachusetts and has now become such an activist, um, in fighting for our schools. Um, I think it's really a model for all of us. But before I call on Anne, I just want to conclude a few remarks of my own. Uh, again, so pulling it back to the fact that this evening has been um, in um, memory of my father, Sumner Kaplan. I think some of you who knew him knew that one of his, his famous favorite quotations from um, um, a Jewish source from the Ethics of Our Fathers was, um, that ours is not to complete the job, but neither are we free from to desist from it. And I think listening here today to um, such strong uh, statements, such such wonderful comments from the audience, and really grappling with um, very important issues, it's important for us always to um, have the long view. I sit here today with um, Sue Senator and Bill Schechter and Lisa Geisman and a few others of us who. 12 years ago, organized the first um, MCAS, uh, uh, I should say anti-MCAS forum here in, um, in Brookline, and it's now 12 years later, and many of these same issues were, were on the table 12 years ago, but that should, not be a, that should not be a reason for us to be discouraged, and for us to not continue these very important, not just conversations, but efforts and brainstorming together to really work through strategies of um, fighting back, of expressing our views, and of really producing the kind of democratic and creative and holistic schools that we believe our children are entitled to and that Americans need in order to promote the values that um, we aspire to. So I will just conclude with those remarks of my own, and I will call on the wonderful and inimitable Ann Halloran, uh, president of CPS, to conclude our evening. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I, I'll say one thing about Sumner Kaplan as well. Um, when I was very new to CPS, and I would go to meetings, I had my eye on Sumner. Because every meeting, at least once, I could see his lips starting to curl up a little bit, and I knew he was going to poke a hole in something he was saying. He had a great sense of humor. The other thing I want to say is that when I was an active union member in Boston and in Newton, uh, I always thought we were alone. Just, I thought we were alone. 
And I didn't realize that it was this network of groups um, that cared about what was going on in schools. So CPS fell into my lap almost literally. I was, so if you, if you ever think leaving a flyer someplace isn't a worthwhile endeavor, I saw a flyer on a chair at a union meeting and I picked it up and took it home. And months later when I retired, I went to see Marilyn and I've been enslaved ever since. No, I've been active ever since. So I just want to say, the teachers here, if you're a teacher, raise your hand, would you mind? Okay, there's a few teachers here. Um, don't think it's just, you know, our unions are, are great and strong and helpful, but there is so much more out there. And um, so a group like CPS, which goes from, we'd like to go to the Berkshires, Deborah, we haven't gotten quite that far yet, but we're going uh, to many places around the state trying to work with community groups that are organizing around these issues. Uh, so it's a, it's a great group, as all, all the others that were mentioned this evening. Um, I just want to say also, and then I'll be quiet, uh, you know, all the commentary that was said tonight that, that leads to one thing, and that is that we have to be able to decide as individuals that we can do something important. Um, last week I had a chance to go and speak with the League of Women Voters in Waltham. They had asked me if I could explain the new, <laughs> new evaluation system to them. That was before I had looked at it. Anyway, so I, I, we were and we, we, we started talking about the evaluation, but like halfway through the meeting, the room was taken over by these people who were not educators, but they were fired up about what on earth was going on with schools. And the mayor was sitting there. I didn't really know the mayor. She was sitting there and she said, you know what you people, you will have to call your reps, you have to call your senators, you have to make noise if you care about these issues. So I just encourage you to go out and make noise. Thank you. 